Thank you, young people. The book of 1 Samuel tonight, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, if you want to be turning there, uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 16, and it's already been a good day, and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight, and I believe that He will help us uh, if we allow Him to do so. Now, I gave you a, an idea this morning, I told you what I'd be preaching on tonight, and I preach on the subject of dealing with disappointments. And so uh, we will look at that subject tonight. And uh, I don't want to uh, disappoint you by letting you out early. And so uh, we'll take our time uh, this evening and see these truths that God has for us. First Samuel chapter number 16, I'm going to read one verse of Scripture uh, this evening for our text before we pray. And that's verse number 1, <clears throat> First Samuel 16, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now from that verse of scripture, we're going to get our message this evening. I'm going to preach on the subject of dealing with disappointments. I want you to give me your attention tonight. I always want your attention. Uh, but tonight, I, I realize the weight of the message that I'm preaching. I want every Christian to listen to me. I want parents to listen to me. I want our single adults to listen to me. I want staff to listen to me. We look at this one verse of Scripture, and it's an important verse because God preserved it. But if we revisit, as we will in a few minutes, the things that transpired in the previous chapter, and the things that transpire after this verse of Scripture. It's one of the most pivotal points in the history of the nation of Israel. And I can imagine with this size crowd that there's somebody sitting where Samuel sat in chapter 16, verse number 1. Disappointments are a decision point in our life. And tonight, we're going to see what the Bible says about dealing with disappointments. Father, help us this evening as we consider the truths of your word. May the message help us. This is your word that you're sending tonight. May we allow your spirit to speak to our hearts. I pray you'll use it, for in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Samuel is certainly one of the, what we would call a major Bible, Old Testament Bible character. He had a unique ministry as he spans certain periods of time and history in the nation of Israel. I believe he was an underrated Bible character, although we know of Samuel. The more I learn about this man Samuel, the more I find him relatable in certain respects. And that is, he's experienced things that many of us experience. He's a great man of God greatly used of God. What a life that God allowed him to live and the things that he saw in his life from the being called as a child and you, and you know the story and how uh, even that he was given life as a, as a promise and reward to the faithfulness of his mother and the things that he got to see. But Samuel lived the life of disappointments. But Samuel spent his life in this period of time in, in, in the nation of Israel coming out of that, that period of, if you call it wanderings, and that period of the judges and, and not having that direction. And, and they, they made a mistake in saying, instead of having God continue to rule over us and us surrender to Him, we want a king like everybody else. And I've preached on the life of Saul many times, and God said, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. And by the way... God will give us what we want, and then we'll regret getting what we want. Saul started the way Saul should have started. And Samuel latched on to this young man and invested in him, anointed him. In chapter number 15, and it's a powerful chapter, a sad chapter, but powerful in how God deals with Saul. Samuel had invested his life into Saul. That's time he couldn't get back. And to the teenagers and to the, to the young people here, we need to remember that the time that's been put into you by your parents, they don't get it back. 
The time put in you by Sunday school teachers, they don't get it back. The time invested by your pastor, it's his life, he doesn't get it back. Saul had rebelled against God. And in doing so, it was manifested in the fact that Saul betrayed and rose up against Samuel. Might I also say there's no new thing under the sun? Saul, it was bad enough that Saul rebelled against God. In doing so, Saul had trampled on the investment made in him by Samuel. Saul had filled with pride, and we see this play out in chapter 15, and finds him in a place where he had become unusable by God. Now Samuel, because of that, finds himself at a place where he had been disappointed by someone he loved and had invested in. But it was more than that. There was now a nation without the right kind of leader. It was more than that. See, Samuel's own children had not followed the right way. And Saul came along and became as a son to Samuel. So because Saul, Saul, Samuel's own children, and that is one of the reasons why that those men in Israel used that against Samuel in getting a king to begin with. Samuel, your own children aren't doing right. Who do we have to look to after you? And to use that personal situation against God's man to get what they wanted. Well, if you know your Bible, you can think back to that conversation between Samuel and God, and God said, no, Samuel, give them what they want. But Samuel said, God, if that's what you want, then I'm going to do it, and he latched on to that young man, Saul. And if you read the story of Samuel and Saul, you'll find a relationship that there never was between Samuel and David. Samuel invested himself, and they spent time together, and he taught them, and he would come to his house, and, and he invested in him, and for a period of time, Saul was everything that you would want in a king. Maybe this is going to work out okay, because Saul is who we think he is. I mean, Saul was goodlier than any other young men, and Samuel had done the right things with him, and Saul started right. And Saul was doing right. And there was victories won because of Saul. And Saul came out strong and laid down the lines in certain places and said, this is what we're going to do. And Israel had a leader. Saul got puffed up. Saul rebelled. And he lost his anointing. By the way, just a thought to put in your mind. David, who we know of his sin, never lost his anointing. But when Saul rose up against the word of God and the man of God, he lost his anointing. Samuel's own children had not followed the right way, and Saul was to Samuel like a son. Might I just interject here? Uh, by the way, no one blames Samuel for the rebellion of his sons. So quit blaming yourself for the failure of a child. And by the way, maybe preachers need to hear it, Sunday school teachers need to hear it. No one blames Samuel for the failure of Saul. So quit blaming yourself for the rebellion of someone. See, it was more than just that disappointment that Saul brought. Samuel's dream for his nation, in his mind, was now destroyed by the actions of somebody else. You imagine Samuel was disappointed? You ima imagine that Samuel, this great man of God, this great man of faith, this man that was called from his mother's womb, found himself in a place grieved, hurting. 
Samuel's lived a lot of life by this point. I wonder if the Bible tells us that these, these, these men and women we read on the pages of Scripture, they were flesh as we are flesh. They have emotions as we have emotions. They have battles as we had, they had battles as we have battles. I can imagine Samuel feeling a little sorry for himself and, and I've spent my life and I've invested myself and I've had these disappointments along the way and now Saul of all people, the person that I've loved, the person that I've mentored, the person that I put my whole life into, I have had to rebuke. I have had to be the messenger to tell him that God is removing the kingdom from your family and that God would, and I will see you no more. You imagine the heartbreak for him to leave Saul and say, I'll never see you again. We'll never speak again. I don't think that's the way Samuel thought it would end. But that's where we find him in chapter 16 and verse number 1. Disappointed. I know the answer to this, but have you ever been disappointed? Disappointment usually is not subtle. Usually disappointment blindsides you. You might can see the signs of it, but you you never really see the full effect of it until it hits you. That reality sets in. There's a lot of things that you and I could be disappointed about tonight. And in context, we find the disappointments in the actions of others. We look at the things that have taken place in our nation, and there's there's certainly some things to be disappointed about. There's some some things that we can be disappointed about that takes place in our churches. There's some things that come into our life that can disappoint us from a doctor's report to the actions of others to, 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 to the way just our life has played out. And many of us could say, my life didn't play out the way I thought it was going to play out. I th- and sometimes it's even, I thought I would have this ministry for forever, and now I've been removed from that, and there's, a, there's disappointment. So what are we to do with that disappointment? And by the way, let me just say to you, if you're disappointed tonight, you're not special. Everybody's got disappointment. Well, Pastor, I just, I'm just disappointed. I mean, do you, you want a pat on the back? Do you want a hug? Do you want applause? We're, we all have disappointments. The measure of your life is not whether or not you face disappointments. The measure of your life is how you deal with those disappointments, what you do with those disappointments, how you overcome those disappointments. Disappointments come, and if you've had great disappointments, let me help you. If you live another week, there's going to be more disappointments. There's going to be some things you have hope in. You say, this is, if this just happens and this happens, and, and I believe that this is going to take place, we can be awfully disappointed. Maybe you've come to a place in life and you've lived a lot of life and you say, I I thought I'd be further down the road than this. Can I tell you what I see in verse number one? And I think you'll see it too when we start pointing it out. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from the reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king among his sons. We know the story. He's going to go to the house of Jesse. At the time when he is confronting Saul, at the time we find him in verse number 1, there's a red-headed young man faithfully keeping the sheep of his father that God is going to do a great work with. But he doesn't know that. He doesn't know. He's, he's just caught up in his disappointment. He's just caught up in the memory and the pain and the hurt of having to rebuke the very one that he had his hopes and dreams in. He had seen the days when prostitution was at the temple door. He had seen the days of Ichabod where it says, God hath departed. He had seen those days. And now he had hope and he had dreams that Israel would turn to God and God would use Israel. And now he's been disappointed by the actions of others. Let me show you what I see. Number one, let me say this evening... The season of mourning must end. The season of mourning must end. 
Now listen to me very carefully as we see the question God places to Saul. How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? God did not rebuke Samuel for mourning. Mourning is a natural reaction to the disappointment. Samuel was not wrong for mourning. And by the way, when you're disappointed and you feel that hurt and you feel that grief and you mourn, that's a natural reaction. Matter of fact, I will say to you, it's unhealthy if you don't mourn. But the season of mourning must come to an end. What does that mean, Pastor? Does it mean I don't hurt anymore? That'll ne- that, that may never happen in some circumstance. It's okay that you mourn, but notice what God says. How long? There comes a time when the season of mourning is over because there is more life to live. There is more work to be done. There is more that God has us to do. God was not saying to Samuel, stop loving Saul. He was saying, how long are you going to mourn the disappointment? How long are you going to let it paralyze you? How long are you going to feel sorry for yourself? How long are you going to focus on what is behind instead of looking at what is ahead? And friend, might I say to you tonight, if you've been disappointed, there must come a time when that season of mourning comes to an end. What was he saying? It's time to get on to the next thing. It's time to see what else there is to do. I say, number one, when you're disappointed, the season of mourning must end. Number two, when you deal with disappointment, you must accept what you cannot change. How long will thou mourn for Saul? There are sometimes, Christian, listen to me. We stay in our season of mourning because we're still hoping that something will change about the situation. And as long as I'm mourning, I'm still attached to that event, to that individual, to that circumstance, to that dream. But when you accept that which you cannot change, when you get up, it's time to accept What we cannot change. Look what the Lord says to Samuel. How long will thou mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Samuel could not change what God did. Can I help us tonight? You can't change what God did. You can't change what God allows. You can't change what God is doing. God said, I have rejected him. And the sooner that we accept what we cannot change. Do you think that if if Samuel had the power to change Saul's heart, he would have changed it? Absolutely. But he had no power over Saul's heart. He could do nothing over Saul's heart. God allowed these things to take place, and God said, I'm making a change. I'm taking it from Saul, and I have somebody else that I'm giving it to. I have rejected him because of my word. There's nothing, nothing that Samuel could do about that, and he had to accept that fact so that he could move on from his mourning. And friend, you've got to, you're have got you not going to get out of your season of mourning until you accept what you can't change. All of us, I would say, if we had the power, there's some things that we would change. There's some people that are really in glory that we would still have here. But we can't change that. You have to accept that. And there's some that will stay in that perpetual mourning, that perpetual grief, that perpetual disappointment, that perpetual feeling sorry for themselves because they've never gotten to a place to accept what God has done, what God has allowed. He says, seeing I have rejected him. Are you with me tonight? We deal with disappointments. We see he, God admonished him to move on from the season of mourning. 
It's okay to mourn, but this season must end. Samuel had to accept what he could not change. Number three, please listen very carefully. If you're going to deal with your disappointment, well, let me, let, me, let me point this out. He says, I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil. You see that? Why would Samuel the prophet need to fill his horn with oil? Because there was somebody else God was going to anoint. Don't miss this. Fill thine horn with oil. Pastor, we're talking about dealing with disappointments. Let me give you number three. Some of you, you're not going to grab a hold of this. But you need to do the best you can to do it. Simply see the big picture. Why did he need to fill his horn with oil? Because while he was mourning, God was still working. While he was bringing Saul down, he was raising David up. And friend, you can be disappointed. It's a natural reaction of life. But don't think that God's not still working. This door can close over here. This part of our life can seemingly be taken from us. And I invested and look at this, this happened. And sometimes as churches, we get disappointed because things happen in a different way than we thought. And things didn't happen that we think were going to happen. But friend, God would say to us, it, quit mourning, get up, accept it. And by the way, fill your horn with oil because the time that you've been weeping, the time that you've been grieving, the time that I've closed this door, or the time that you've been, been receiving, the consequences of others' actions, I've still been working, and it's time to fill your horn with oil because there's another king to anoint. And there's a lot of Christians, I believe, many times you stay in that period of disappointment, and God would say to you, fill that horn with oil again because there's another work to be done. I've, I've not stopped working. I've not finished my task. Matter of fact, you've got more to do. There's more for you to do. I'm sending you to the house of Jesse. You need to have your oil. Friend, I can, I'll tell you what some, some Christians tonight need to do. You need to go home and find your horn. Because you're disappointed the last time it was used. Could you imagine? I don't think this is what happened, but could you imagine? Samuel, some of you wouldn't blame him. You take that horn and after Saul's disappointment, take it and stand on some cliff somewhere and on the bank of some body of water and throw it as far as they can. What good did this do? Wasn't the horn that was the problem. As a matter of fact, you can teach a Sunday school class for 30 years and be disappointed by some of the results. But can I tell you, God hadn't stopped working. Well, I'm disappointed after all these years. I don't understand why somebody would do that. God's still working. Go find your horn. Fill it with oil. Well, Pastor, we thought some things for the church would, would work out a little bit differently, and, and yet God didn't allow that to happen. Fill your horn with oil because God's not working, and we need to try and see the big picture. Boy, it's a gift to the child of God if you can step back. We don't know everything God is doing. But realize that there's something God is doing. And we're just part of that little picture. Most of the time we look at situations as what is right in front of our face. But you've got to remember that God sees the whole picture. God sees everything. See, why did he need to fill his horn with oil? Because God had another king. God had not forsaken his people. And can I, can I say this? Samuel, God had more for Samuel to do. If Saul was his only purpose, I can see how in the mind of Samuel, God, you, 
you, you called me. You had me in the temple under Eli, and I watched your judgment on your people. I watched your judgment on the, the filth that was taking place in your temple, and how you'd been ignored. I watched your judgment. I can see how from a logical standpoint, Samuel would say, oh, you've put me here to set up Saul to be that first king. When I'm done doing that task that you had me, I'll be finished. I'll be ready to go to glory. And now Saul is disappointed. and It seems like his whole life has been wasted. But God still had something else for Samuel to do. Let me just be very direct. There's some of you that's sitting back there and you're disappointed and you think that your life's been wasted and you're disappointed by the way circumstances took place in your life and I thought this would happen, but this happened and, and there's, there, there's decisions made by other people that affects you and say, well, now it's just a big waste and I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. Well, if you're still here, let me just give you some good advice tonight. Go get your horn and fill it with oil. Because God is still working. He's still got something else for you to do. He's still got something else for you to invest your life in. We've got to try and see the big picture. Because of his disappointment, Samuel was just focused on his hurt. On his disappointment. But he had lost sight of the fact that God's not going to forsake his people. And God's going to raise somebody else up. Let me give you number four. This one's going to be real deep. He says, fill thine horn with oil and go. Number four is very simple. Take action. He said, go. Where was he to go? He was to go to the house of Jesse. Because God was going to raise up another king. Samuel still had a part to play. God could have used somebody else, but he's still using Samuel. He said, fill thine horn with oil, because there's still a king to be anointed. And Samuel, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go. He tells him where to go, but God doesn't tell him how it's all going to work out. And I would dare say there's Christians sitting in front of me tonight or perhaps watching the service tonight that you hear everything I'm saying and you say, okay, I get filled. The... Now, he says, go. Now, God, are you going to tell me who that next king is? Are you going to tell me how this is going to... Can you tell me who that next person in my Sunday school class is going to be that God's going to raise up? Tell me the next soul that I'm going to win. Tell me the next part of my life where I can make an investment so I know how to go. No, he just said go. He pointed him in a direction. And if you know the story, it was the least likely one to be chosen king. He didn't tell... Samuel, who was going to be king? He said, go to the house of Jesse. And if you know the story, Samuel comes, calls Jesse, and he marches in his sons, youngest to oldest, and he says, it's got to be him. Look at the ability. Look at the talent. And God said, nope. The next one comes in. It's got to be this one. God says, nope. And he goes through the whole List of, of young men, and he says, Jesse, do you have anybody else? God, it's not any of them. And he says, well, I got David. <laughs> He's out there keeping the sheep. He says, well, you better go get him. Because I filled my horn with oil. And God sent me down here with a full horn. I'm not going home with a full horn of oil. So you're going to bring a king here. You're going to bring somebody here that God is going to use before I go home. And friend, that's the mindset that you and I need to have. God still got me here. He still got a purpose here. David comes and I'm paraphrasing. God says, I've chosen 
a man after my own heart. Don't miss this. You're just supposed to go. And God's given us enough direction in this book for every child of God here, no matter how little or big your disappointments are. And he says, go. And along the way, I will reveal to you where to put your life. We have enough direction in this book. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what we're still supposed to do. We're still to invest in prayer. We're still to invest financially. We're still to invest our life in the life of somebody else. Hey, so you had a, a childhood that was, that, was, that was disappointing. God still got you here. There's somebody else that you're supposed to help. Say, well, well, I've been disappointed by the actions of others, and part of my, my life's investment is gone, and I'll never get that back. But as long as you have a horn, and as long as the oil still works, and we know what a picture of the oil is in the Bible, don't we? As long as it still works, there's still a work that can be done. There's still somebody else I can invest in. Now here's a young man, with, 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 as the old man Samuel anoints the young man, God is going to raise up to be the king. And I cannot emphasize that enough. It's just go. Well, if, if I know without any guarantee that I'll never be disappointed again, I mean, you're still going back to Walmart, aren't you? <laughs> you're still a Miami Dolphin fan, aren't you? I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I was going to say Florida Gator, but I don't want to kick people when they're down. So, you know, and, and you still go back for more. Well, I'll serve God as long as I don't get disappointed anymore, as long as I don't get hurt anymore. Friend, God says, grab your horn, fill it with oil, go. And while you're being obedient to Him, He will give you that next part of your life. The relationship with David was much different than it was with Saul. It was different. It was unique with Saul. But it was unique with David. Let me finish the message with this statement. I'll, I'll, I'll set up the statement. I'll tell you when I'm going to make the statement. I'll get there in about 20 minutes. It's a fascinating, and I, and I stress this, it's a fascinating relationship to me, Samuel and Saul. It's fascinating. All that Samuel put into Saul. Then you see the rise and the fall of Saul. It was a hard fall. I can only begin to feel the emotions and the pain that Samuel must have felt. I don't know if you read it when you read chapter 15. Or you see it when you read chapter 15. But I can feel the emotion. I feel a very, I, I, I see on those, in the page of scripture a very strong man. Who loves God more than he loves the people he's invested in. And by the way, when your children disappoint you, if you leave God for them, you love them more than you love God. If people disappoint you and they leave God, they leave the church, they leave... they. If you follow them, you love them more than you love God. That co however you want to put it. Well, I've been disappointed. You're not special. We've all been disappointed. I, I see, I can imagine, I can sympathize somewhat, empathize a little bit with Samuel. Because when Samuel confronted Saul... He had to confront the memories in his mind of every time Saul sat at his supper table and he mentored him. The hopes and the dreams that not just Samuel had in Saul, 
but Israel had in Saul. And friend, he faced that disappointment. We find him in chapter number 1, and here's the, uh, chapter number 16, verse number 1, and here's the statement I want you to remember tonight. Samuel's greatest impact came after his disappointments. There's no doubt that he still was disappointed, but we find the scripture recording before this moment, this moment his disappointments. After this moment, we find his greatest impact. No doubt he had impact before this moment. He had impacted Saul, who had a positive impact for a time. He had held a nation together, if you will, by being God's man and his prayer life and his intercession between man and God and that nation. And no doubt he was there for such a time as this in this period of history. But he was disappointed by his own children who did not follow in his ways. Then he was disappointed in a man that God gave him to pour himself into and to set up as the hope of a nation. And he was disappointed once again. He had made an impact up to this point. But I will submit to you tonight that his greatest impact came after his disappointments. His greatest impact was when he could mourn. And God said, it's time to cut the season of mourning. It's time to get up and go find David. His greatest impact came when, when God said, it is time for you to accept what you cannot change. And I believe in those words what God was saying to Samuel. Samuel, you know it's not your fault. You know you did everything you were supposed to do. I have rejected him. And I wonder who needs to hear that tonight. It's not your fault that somebody made those decisions they made. It's not your fault that God took somebody on the glory. It's not your fault that life didn't play out the way that it played out. He's saying, I have rejected him. And the sooner we accept that, the sooner we can make that great impact by going and finding David. His greatest impact came after God reminded him, hey, there's a big picture. While life is full of disappointments, I haven't stopped working. I haven't been surprised. I haven't been shocked. And as a matter of fact, I've still got a plan. And friend, there's a lot in our nation we can be disappointed with, but God is not done working. God is not through doing what God is going to do. And in our churches and in our home, friend, we need to get that horn. And if you'd fill it up with oil tonight, I will submit to you that in the midst of your disappointment, it, it, during life in disappointment, you can still have a great impact. If you just get up and go, Samuel's greatest impact came after his disappointment. David was certainly a different man than Saul. But I believe Samuel probably approached David a little bit differently than he did Saul. Because Samuel had learned some things in his investment in Saul. He's wiser now. And friend, there's some things that we can only learn through disappointment. I wonder, I'm not minimizing Samuel as a man of God. I'm just going to point out his humanity like ours. I wonder if, I just wonder, I'm just, I'm just speculating. If he leaned less on his own wisdom with David than he did with Saul. I don't know. But I do know this. Saul was goodlier, the Bible says, than any other man. Samuel had an impact on a goodly man. But God also used Samuel to anoint a man after God's own heart. And it's not known as the city of Saul. It's known as the city of David. David. It's not as known as the throne of David. 
It's no, or the, or the throne of Saul. It's known as the throne of David. The Savior, the Messiah, is not coming from the lineage of Saul, but the lineage of David. I believe that Samuel probably thought, well, I did what I could, but it's over. I'm an old man now. God's rejected Saul. But God comes to Samuel and said, Samuel, you're not done yet. It's time for you to take off the sackcloth and ashes. Except it's not your failure. It's not your fault. I rejected Saul. Still have your horn, Samuel? Go fill it with oil. And go. Christian, you still have your horn? Can you still pray? You still got your Bible? There's still somebody that you can invest in before God takes you home. There's still something that you can do when God takes you home. You're mourning. At some point, that season must end. And I would submit to you tonight that Samuel's greatest impact came after his disappointment. Wonder how many Christians who've been disappointed, they miss the opportunity to have another impact. They miss the opportunity to still do a work for God. Samuel saw the demise of, of Saul. He saw the end of Saul. He watched the greatness of the kingdom of David from heaven. We've got to get out of this mindset that if I can't enjoy it on this side of eternity, there's no point in me investing in it. The greatest impact will be viewed from heaven. Tonight, the invitation is very simple. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to weep. It's okay to hurt. That's a natural reaction. But at some point, something's got to switch and say the season's got to come to an end because God's still got to work for me to do. At some point, Christian... You've got to accept what God has done or what God has allowed to take place. The reason being, because until you do that, that horn's just going to sit over to the side. You're not going to be able to grasp that this whole time that the, my world has stopped, the whole time I've been focused on this disappointment, God's still been working. God has still been moving. And it might just be time for somebody to get in a fight again. It might just be time for somebody to say, Pastor, if you, if you find me a place or I'll open my, I'll start a Sunday school class again. It might be time for somebody to get on a bus again and, and go start a bus ride. It might be time for somebody to say, you know what, I'm going I'm to get involved in these ministries because there, there's still something for me to do, and there's, a, there's another life that God has for me to invest in, and I'm going to get that old horn out, and it, the horn wasn't the problem. The horn worked fine. It held that oil, and the oil's still working today. I'm going to fill that horn with oil, and if God will just point me in a direction, he doesn't have to tell me who it is because I'm going to look at everybody. And, and is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? And God will say, that's the person that you can still impact. That's the person that you can still make a difference in. The invitation is very simple. Wherever you find yourself tonight, maybe you're young and you haven't faced that big disappointment. It's coming. It's coming. And when it comes, mourn. That season's got to come to an end. Tonight, who needs to put an end to their season of mourning? It could be days, but in some cases it's been years. 
It's time to accept it. I didn't say like it. There's a lot of things that I've had to, in my own mind and life, move on from that I don't like. I don't agree with it. But then again, I'm not God. God didn't ask me. I've got to accept it. I've got to move on and realize I've still got my horn. I can fill it with oil. I can do something. There's somebody else that God wants me to impact. But if that's you tonight, why don't you get your, why don't you come tell God I'm going to get my horn out again. I'm going to fill it with oil. There's some tonight you need to do that and just say, God, point me. Point me. In the days I have left, I'll do whatever I can do to do that work for you. Father, we yield to you.